I must say this, that uh, I've been faithfully following uh, Valentine Annan. Uh, he was a senior, much senior to me in Allahabad in the same college. And he was the first speaker at Open Up. And even today, Annan led us in prayer. So I'm so grateful uh, that I've been faithfully following him. And uh, thank you all for joining in this Open Up. I do really pray and I'm sure that it's been a blessing to us. And through us, the blessing is passing on to people in our own circles of influence. Let me also take this moment to thank uh, Mr. Sudan David and the team for all the effort that you've put in and for the vision behind this. Uh, may God bless this effort of yours. So we're looking at the theme verse, Second Chronicles 7.14. It reads this way. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. If my people shall humble themselves, would you please join me for another word of prayer, please? Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for this lovely opportunity through this online platform that, Lord, we could listen to different speakers, interact, with them and Lord for this wonderful opportunity to also Lord have this conversation this prayer with you as new input comes our way so Lord we pray for your blessing upon today's uh, talk and the Q&A Lord we truly pray that God the Holy Spirit would lead us, teach us and also change us Lord because education is not just in the head but Lord needs to transform us and Lord in turn transform the society so we thank you for this lovely opportunity that we could pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My first point is, are we people on the pursuit of humility? Well, we are on the pursuit of many things. We want to do a lot for the Lord. But the question is, are we on a pursuit of humility? I want to raise this question basically for self-introspection. And then also give us a grid to try and see, are we living up to the standard that is expected of us or not? And do the course correction, whatever the Lord may impress upon our hearts. As you very well know, so do I, humility is one of the noblest virtues. And I suspect very least sought after. We seek after many other things. When we have our prayer points, lots of things come our way. We want physical help. We even have spiritual prayer points. But I guess not often do we ask for meekness as a quality, as a virtue that we can imbibe. Why is that? Why are we treating meekness that way? Or even if you and I have a one-year plan in the ministry, there are many things we could write up. But would Meekness or humility be one point that we would ask the Lord that he would make us humble. The kind of humility that Jesus himself showed us, especially as we read this passage in Philippians chapter 2. I think as we are all facing this lockdown and some of us I'm sure are thinking about shedding some weight, I think it's also a good time to think about shedding some pride. Meekness is something the Lord really wants to invite us to take seriously. But there is a tragedy in this pursuit. I struggle with this myself. While you and I know that humility is a good thing, it is also very possible for us to fake it. So we have two problems. Number one, we may not be meek or humble. And number two, sometimes we pretend to be very humble. Now that is another problem that needs to be dealt with. So that is something we need to consider, ask ourselves the question, ask God to help us discover if there is any area of in our lives where we are not humble people, that God would help us, touch us and heal us. Secondly, what meekness is not. Now meekness does not mean withdrawal, like a lackadaisical approach to issues. But I think, well, I'm not going to engage with this issue or engage with this person because I'm a meek person. I don't think meekness is that, at least not the way the Bible 
presence meekness. Now that is a dangerous kind of a meekness because you tend to withdraw from people. You don't show love and respect for people. You are basically telling people, well, you do deal with your situation, I'll deal with mine, and that kind of disengagement is what we see. But I think the Bible calls us to have that kind of a love for people that Christ himself showed us, which means meekness is very active, engaging. In fact, the word meekness itself, the original word, if you go to the etymology, it comes from this picture word of a horse in reins. That powerful animal that is by bit, bit and brittle held together. And the horse chooses to kind of submit to authority. So there is a lot of power that we are talking about. So meekness is that kind of a restraint because we are in submission to God. We are willing to submit to his authority, to his guidance, and also because we respect people. So we need to be careful what meekness really is. There is a story told of this big black American who got into a bus in the United States. He sat next to a teenage Caucasian boy. The white boy was not happy that a black man was sitting next to him, was trying to signal asking the black man to move. The black man obliged and moved a little, but this little boy kept asking, kind of elbowing, asking the black man to move to another seat. Little later, the, this black gentleman was getting off the bus, but before he left, he pulled out his card and turned it into this teenager. And the card said, Joe Lewis, world heavyweight boxing champion. The restraint. The world only knows power the way it's expressed. But I think meekness is power that's kind of handled and controlled by a higher authority. So we need to think that meekness is not just becoming a doormat in that sense, but an active engagement, recognizing God's sovereignty and also respect for the people that we engage with. What else is meekness uh, not? Someone said, meekness is not thinking less of oneself. It is thinking less often of oneself. I don't think we are called to degrade ourselves, assuming that is some form of a humility. We need to recognize how God has made us the plans and the purpose God has in our lives. But that preoccupation with self, that possession of that personal ambition or desire or interest or convenience that drives us is definitely what I believe the Bible questions or even God would want us to work on. Thirdly, when we say meekness and the tendency is, okay, I'm not as good as you are. We try to kind of uplift other people. But I want to say one more thing. You and I are people who are being made in the image of God day by day. Now, this means we need to recognize God's work in our lives. I might be a failure. I might fail time and again, but yet I must be honest to recognize God's work in my life. Just yesterday, I was reading the story of George Whitfield, that famous evangelist, arguably the best evangelist in the 18th century. Now, so he had a number of things to his disadvantage. He came from a very poor background. He lost his father early. He had to work hard. But this guy kept at it. And eventually, he graduated from the Cambridge University. But how was he able to make it? because he worked as a servitor. He was helping out the other wealthy students by carrying out chores for them, thereby he could pay his own fees. So nothing was really in his favor, except that God's hand was upon him. And eventually he made such an impact, not just in England, but also in North America. So when you think about humility, I think as Christians, as God's people, we are called to recognize God's continual work in our lives and recognize that and not undermine God's work in our lives. What else meekness is not? Now I realize in our culture, we talk a lot about servant leadership. Uh, it feels like somehow we are willing to talk about servant nature or servanthood, about humility, but still we want this other word attached to it, leadership. Why not just talk about servant nature? 
not even servanthood? Why not servant nature? Why not seek after servant nature? Why is it everybody wants to become a leader? Well, I really don't know. We need to answer that question honestly to ourselves. So recognizing that Jesus himself stepped into this world, taking upon him the, the nature, very nature of a servant. Now, that is very crucial for us to have as a benchmark. So thirdly, first we saw uh, the pursuit of humility. Then we said what meekness or humility is not. And thirdly, these are some common Christian blind spots. Firstly, we find there's always a recognition or a search for some kind of glamour in Christian ministry. Certain gifts get noticed, be it in the church or be it in an organization. Well, he can preach well or he or she is a good worship leader. Uh, certain gifts get noticed. But these are only few of the many gifts the Lord gives to his church. Why are we leaning? Isn't, it that, an, isn't that an example of we getting, our influ, uh, getting influenced by the world outside? We need to recognize that hospitality is a gift. Service is a gift. Encouragement is a gift. And how well our churches would do if we recognize people with those gifts and recognize them because they are going to be recognized in eternity. If you only want to go after the worship leader or the preacher or one of those uh, uh, gifts that is get very noticeable, we are missing out on the servants of God who will be rewarded richly by the Lord. So we need to be very careful how we decide, how we plan, who we recognize. It's a question of our own value system. So the church is on a mission. The church is very strategic in its planning. It looks for skillful people. It looks for resources. It looks for uh, people who can support the work, the ministry. But we sometimes miss out on this cardinal principle that Jesus left behind for us when he said, whoever wants to be the greatest must be the servant of all. Period. Very simple, very clear. Whoever wants to be the greatest must be the servant of all. Friends, I'm sure you also sense this. In the world that we live in, we human beings have become very smart. That it is possible for you and I to actually run a Christian organization. May I say this cautiously? Even a church without help from God, because we can draw up a neat plan, we can develop the strategy, identify a support, donor support. We can do a lot of these things on our own. But we need to remember, unless we walk in step with the Lord, we are not doing His ministry. We need to constantly depend on God. So meekness and humility becomes very crucial for a Christian worker, for a child of God. Imagine having a kid in your home who is very talented, but who's not humble. And the parents can testify how hard that might be to kind of bring up this child. So it's very important to practice humility and meekness because we have a great God and I think that itself needs to keep us in place. Secondly, another blind spot that I see, within churches in our Christian communities, there's a seeking after the gifts of the Spirit over against ignoring the fruit of the Spirit. Now we need to remember that Galatians 5, 22 and 23, which talks about the fruit of the Spirit, especially in verse 23, it begins with the word meekness in the King James Version. Other versions have gentleness. So meekness is a fruit of the Spirit. In fact, the whole fruit of the Spirit, uh, which includes love, joy, peace, patience, uh, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness or meekness and self-control, if you follow carefully, all of them have this component of meekness. What is peace? What is forbearance? What is kindness? What is faithfulness? So meekness is there, very central in the fruit of the Spirit. And those of us, as we desire to grow more and more into the likeness of the Lord, may I also say this, in the Bible, 
nobody is appreciated. No character in the Bible is appreciated for the gifts they possess. They are appreciated by God for the character they show. Which means God can give gifts to anybody. Even a donkey can speak. But character is what becomes important for God. So we see how meekness becomes such an important cornerstone in our walk with the Lord. Uh, thirdly, another, uh, I think I mentioned this already, a blind spot, servant leadership over against servant nature. So let's move on. The fourth question I want to raise is, is there another way? Outside of meekness, outside of that humility, that gentleness, is there another way? No, my dear friends. Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. In all likelihood, it's a reference to Psalm 37. Because the psalm, uh, psalmist there talks about this. He talks about the successes of the people in the world and is concerned about it, about the wicked prospering. And this verse is taken right out of that. Uh, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That's what our Lord said. And the Bible is very categorical about this. Contrary to what the world says, the rich and the famous, the high and the mighty, the bold and the beautiful, the strong and the powerful, Jesus said, the meek shall inherit the earth. Please follow the words of the famed British journalist Malcolm Muggeridge, who also worked in Lucknow in India. I'm happy to share these notes with you. Uh, maybe in a day or two, I'll put it in a PDF and forward it to Mega. But this is what Malcolm Muggeridge said. Keep this verse in the back of your heads. But Jesus said, the meek shall inherit the earth. And Muggeridge said this, we look back on history and what do we see? Revolutions and counter-revolutions. Wealth accumulated, wealth dispersed. One nation dominant and then another. Shakespeare speaks of the rise and fall of the great ones that ebb and flow with the moon. In my own lifetime, says Muggeridge, I have seen my fellow countrymen ruling over a quarter of the world and a great many of them convinced in what was still a favorite song that God who made the mighty would make them mightier at. I've heard a cracked, cracked Austrian proclaim to the world the establishment of a German rake that would last for a thousand years. An Italian clown announced to the world that he would restart the calendar with his own assumption of power. A murderous Georgian brigand in, the, brigand in the Kremlin acclaimed by the intellectual elite in the West as one wiser than Solomon, more humane than Marcus Aurelius. I have seen America wealthier in terms of weaponry, far more powerful than the rest of the world put together. So had the Americans so wished, they could have outdone a Caesar or an Alexander in the range and scale of their conquests. And says Margaret, all in just one lifetime, all gone with the wind. Hitler, Mussolini, dead and remembered only in infamy. Stalin, a forbidden name in the regime he held founded, which had dominated for three decades. America, haunted by fears of running out of precious fluid that keeps the motorways roaring and the smog settling with the troubled memories of a disastrous campaign in Vietnam and the windmills of Watergate. And Ravi Zacharias adds his line to this quotation. Behind the debris of these civilizations stands the gigantic figure of Jesus Christ, in whom and through whom all humanity finds meaning and purpose. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Most of you are from Tamil Nadu, and you might appreciate this example better. A former CM who seemed invincible in her days, and one could actually not imagine this state in her absence. But in a matter of weeks and months, her health deteriorated and she's gone. And today I find it hard to believe that this state goes on and we seemed to have forgotten her. Hardly much reference to her anymore. The Bible says, the meek will inherit the earth. The rich and the mighty, the high and the powerful come and go. The meek will inherit the earth. Listen to this quotation from a pastor. 
if you were a Martian, if you came from planet Mars, living in the first century, would you think Christianity or the mighty Roman Empire with all its glory, which one would survive, the Roman Empire or Christianity? Of course, you wouldn't bet your money on a ragtag group of people that a crucified carpenter from an obscure village had triumphed over the grave. Yet it was so successful that today we name our children Peter and John after the disciples of the Lord Jesus while we call our dogs Caesar and Nero. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. But we have another problem. Meekness is the only way. Pride doesn't help much. Pride leads us to destruction, as the writer in Proverbs reminds us in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18. Friends, our heart needs to be in the right place. We need to be humble, recognizing who God is, recognizing who are the people that are there in our own situations. You know, pride gives a false security. It's not even real. Now, interesting, there is, I want to make this point as well in terms of the understanding of fame and glory. In the Bible, when it talks about fame and glory belonging to the Lord, it, it suggests praise. It suggests worship to the Lord. It also talks about heaviness of God's presence or the reality of God's presence. Interesting, the word is kavod. In the Greek, it's translated as doxa or doxology. Weight of glory, the reality of God's presence. But you and I can easily get conceited, thinking highly, more highly about ourselves than what we ought to think. Solomon, in the book of Ecclesiastes, a great achiever of sorts, a rich man, a powerful king, a wise man. But then he talks about his own failures and he uses this word vanity, vanity. In the Hebrew, the word is hebel, which is also translated as breath or vapor or nothingness. Weight of glory and nothingness. The reality of God's presence and human achievement or human fame which is actually vanity or nothingness. But we could get conceited. We could lean onto the other side. Proverbs 23, verse 29 to 35, talks about an intoxicated man. It talks about wine that is red. It's actually a very picturesque portrayal. It talks about the wine in a cup that invites the man to taste it. In fact, in the Hebrew, it actually means that. It's almost like the wine has got eyes. It's inviting, enticing the man to try out, a possible client to try out the wine. But once the man is drunk, he is living in a false reality. He thinks he's on the high seas. He gets badly beaten and bruised, and he says, nothing has happened to me. So pride can give us a false sense of security. Pride can give us a false sense of reality. But friends, unless you and I are sensitive and conscious about God's presence, we could get conceited. So the question we are coming to is, who God is like? What God is like? And of course, it follows from that, who am I? That's how we understand humility. And then of course, who is my neighbor? Who are the people in my own circle of influence. Allow me to take you through this grid quickly to share with you what Jesus said, uh, how he disclosed himself about his divinity and how do we perceive it and what are the ways we understand the divinity of God. Firstly, I want to take you to Luke's Gospel chapter 4. Here we have Jesus in his hometown of Nazareth. He's begun his public ministry. He's famous slowly going all over the place. He comes to the synagogue in Nazareth where he grew up. And then as was the custom, he was there. He stood up to read. They give him a, script, a scripture. He stood up to read. And the scroll of prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Why that scroll? 
divine providence. Unfolding the scroll, Jesus finds his place where it was written. He's actually referring to two chapters in Isaiah. And then he reads this. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to pro proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He chose certain verses. So on that morning, in Nazareth, at the synagogue, seemingly another regular service, the Son of God stood up to read from these two references to Isaiah. And he says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me to do such and such. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. Now everybody is looking at him. And then he said, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus claims divinity. He identifies himself as the Messiah. But you know what the next verse says? Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 22. All spoke well of him. They were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Then this question, isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. This is a question not of doubt or seeking. This is a question of skepticism. Jesus says to them, he takes, makes a sharp rebuke here. Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, do here in your hometown what we have heard you did in Capernaum. So he's quoting two proverbs to challenge that question. Because when Jesus reveals himself, these religious leaders miss the point. They are not able to see Jesus for who he is because of their own baggage. They're saying, "Ha, oh, we know this guy. He's a local boy. We know him. They're missing out on what they do not know about this person, that he was the very son of God. You may want to read that whole passage because Jesus is sharply critiquing their methodology of coming to recognition of who Jesus was. But I'm going to jump here to the next paragraph. He goes down to the town in Capernaum. And in that synagogue, Jesus is healing a man possessed by a demon. And an impure spirit comes out of him saying in the top of his voice, go away, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us, the Holy One of God? Friends, what a tragedy. The religious leaders in the synagogue were privileged to Jesus' self-introduction of himself and they missed the point, while the demons that were fleeing at his presence recognized that he was the Holy One of God. Sometimes it's because of the baggage with which we come to the table. That baggage colors what we see. It's almost like wearing the wrong set of glasses and viewing right data. What you see will be colored by how you see it. So they miss the point. And then we find that's not the only place where the demons recognize as divinity. We find this time and again in different places. But Jesus revealed himself as a son of God who was going to be the Messiah of the world. But here's my point. Who are we? Very quickly, A, B, C, D. Fact check. Are we conceited or do we recognize who we are in the light of God's word and his presence? Firstly, we are called to be authentic and not artificial. Now, Artificial was a good word once upon a time. I think in the 16th century, the word artificial actually had to, was related to art, how you can portray something so beautifully, creative skill. But today when you say artificial, you know somebody is putting on a facade. They're wearing a mask. They are not who they really are showing them to be. In other words, what the photographs you put on Instagram or Facebook, we put the best photographs, not the real photographs all the time, right? Sometimes it's incredible. We want to shoot photograph after photograph to get just the way what we want to project ourselves as. Authenticity in our lives. Who are you in the light of God's word? Now, Jesus had this amazing word to say about John the Baptist. 
Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11. Here the context is John is in the prison and now he is getting a little confused. So he's sending his disciples to Jesus asking, are you the one or should we wait for somebody else? I believe this is not a question of skepticism. It's a question that seeks. There's a huge difference between somebody who's a skeptic and somebody who is a seeker. A seeker asks questions because they want more knowledge. They're open to input. A skeptic has decided in his or her mind there are no answers. So they're for, forever sitting on the station of doubt. They don't move out of that station. But John is sending his disciples to Jesus and they ask him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect somebody else? Jesus says, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed. So Jesus is already fulfilling Luke's gospel chapter 4 and he's saying go and tell people this and then he made this statement blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me and as John's disciples were leaving Jesus turns to the crowd and talks about John beautiful testimony about John I'm sharing this because it's about authenticity Jesus says what did you go out into the wilderness to see a reed swayed by the wind is that what you went out to see if not, what did he go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Now, what is Jesus really <coughs> communicating here? It's not about the externals. It's about who you are on the inside. John was a man who was firm and strong in his own conviction. And Jesus said, he was the one of whom it was said, I will send my messenger ahead of you will prepare your way before you. In fact, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, is also a beautiful passage to read, especially if you're struggling in your perception of Jesus. Because here also Jesus questions or challenges the methodology people use to study him. The Bible is open to investigation. But then you should be willing to critique your investigation also. Yeah, it's a critique of the critique. That's how we arrive at the truth. But I'm not going into this for want of time. Friends, we are called to be authentic. Now this means if you and I struggle with pride, we need to admit it. We need to go before the Lord and seek his help actively and proactively. Secondly, belief versus behavior. You generally ask a Christian, a church-going Christian, what do you believe in? We will all get the answers right. Or maybe some of us are familiar with the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Statement of Faith. We're very careful about what we believe in, the creeds, the doctrines of the faith. But the question is, what about a behavior? Does the behavior match the belief? Or is there a gap somewhere? So when you and I claim to believe in this God, when you and I claim to believe in God's word, when you and I believe, claim to believe that we are all made in the image of God, does that show in our life, in our lifestyle? The way, let's say, you relate to the stranger on the road or somebody else who's economically deprived or somebody else is struggling in this time of the corona pandemic? Does your doctrine of the Imago day has anything to do the way you respond to that situation? Or is it just a nice belief you have up there in your head with no connection to your real life? Belief and behavior have to match. You know, the number one sin Jesus spoke harshly against in the Gospels, the sin of being pharisaical, pharisaical or hypocritical. Saying the right word, but being very far from matching up to that kind of a belief system. Church, we are called to check where we stand. That's part of humility. Do we really believe that everybody is made an image of God? How do we treat them? How do we respect them? How do we care for them? That is important. I can think of a very good friend of mine who's a cancer survivor. In fact, he at one stage, he was uh, the doctors declared, they said it's very hard and there's no chance, there's no hope for him. But then he recovered. And then my heart was so, I was so appreciative of the person 
who they are now happily married, this friend of mine and uh, his wife, the person who was so willingly came forward to marry him. Now belief and behavior have to match. I can talk about many examples like that of people who actually took the Imago Day concept so seriously, they practice in their lives and how they reached out to others. So firstly, are our lives authentic or is it artificial? Secondly, is there a gap between a belief and a behavior? Thirdly, what about our character and what about a continuity? What am I saying here? To a large extent, our habits are fixed. To a large extent, our lifestyles, our chores, are all, we have a packed day, except of course in the lockdown, we seem to have free time, we don't know what to do. Otherwise, schedules are tight and packed. The question is, is there scope for change? Friends, neuroscience actually tells us today, there is scope for change. There was a very famous example from neuroscience in the 19th century about this particular man who had a rail accident. A, a rod actually went through his part of his brain and miraculously he survived the accident. And then it was found that his personality significantly altered after the accident. So neuroscientists have come to the conclusion, that's one example, there are more, to say that change is possible. Now, if neuroscience says change is possible, and the Bible tells us that you and I are transformed into the image of his son, how much more there is scope. So I don't want you to give up. I don't want to give up. I think we need trust in this God who will, wants to work constantly in us so that our character is not fixed, but there is a continuity. We keep changing. We kind of are becoming more like Christ. We're becoming more humble, more meek like Christ. Fourthly, development or dignity. Where do we get our value from? Is it basically from our degrees or is it because of your cost to the company or is it because of a social status or, or, or what gives you your identity? Not just what gives you your identity, how do you treat other people? Because James talked about it. He said, if you only welcome a man who comes in fine clothes to your party, you're being partial. You don't reflect the God who calls you. You're called to respect the stranger and somebody else who is not as privileged as you are. So where do we place our value for people? How do we treat people? Amartya Sen famously talked about it. He talked about the market value of the masses. Different times in history, different people have had a lot of value. At some time, we needed a lot of doctors, maybe like this time. And there were other times we needed a lot of lawyers. But he talked about the farmers. They need to have a market value. So it's very important where, in fact, I think Amartya Sen on that point is very close to what the Bible is saying. So we need to recognize people, give people value because they are made in the image of God, not because of how the world treats them or what the culture outside says. So that's the A, B, C, D. I could actually go on, but I think my time is coming to a close. So authentic or artificial, belief matching with behavior, character, is it fixed or is there scope for continuity, and development or dignity. Where do we get our dignity from? Friends, the biblical worldview says, last is first. Giving is receiving. Dying is living. Losing is finding. The least is the greatest. Meekness is a strength. The idea is that we are living by God's truth, not by what a culture says should make us happy. So may I invite you to grow in meekness, in that humility, because Jesus himself recognized that and showed us it through his own life in the gospels as we see it and how he treated us. I think we are called to respect and treat others in the same way that God treated us. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, humility. The world may not like it, but I think we are called to that humility. If nothing else motivates us, at least the fact 
that the meek will inherit the earth might motivate us. But I think that should put us on a track to follow the Lord and become more and more like Jesus. Father, we thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to think about humility. But Lord, we thank you because you are able to humble us without humiliating us. You're so very kind and gracious. You're very compassionate, Lord, with us. As far as the East is from the West, Lord, you forgive us. And you extend your loving kindness to us, Lord. You're just so grateful. Father, we pray, Lord, that nature of yours would rub more into our lives, oh, Father. Help us to see you better, know you better, recognize you better, Lord, in all situations. And Lord, in the same way, look at people in our own circle and beyond the way that you would like us to see them, oh, Father. So I pray, Lord, all of us here will be people who are meek and humble because a God is meek and humble. Give us that grace for the glory of your name, we ask. In Jesus' name. Amen.